Hello, everyone. Okay, this is going to be episode four of our series on how to prove a fraudulent version of a verse. And we're going to actually uh, do more Bible study on the impact of the particular discovery we made to show you one thing leads to the next. And sometimes you need to then think about what's the implication on some other verse. So this leads to another problem. So what what's the problem? If Revelation 22, 14 is different in uh, 24 cases out of 31, they need to all be changed is what we showed. It doesn't mean wash their robes that oh, we, excuse me, it, it was a mistake somewhere in the 400s to change it to wash their robes. Somebody made an error. We'll presume it was honest because the words uh, are very similar with six letters changed in order to make it go from obey the commandments to wash the robes. But, and we know conclusively that it is obey the commandments from the beginning because we have multiple sources, Tertullian in, in prior to 222 or 220 when he dies, and Cyprian prior to 258 before he dies. And then it's in the oldest Bible, the Sinaiticus, because remember, there's no complete Bible until the Sinaiticus in 350 AD, or that's, or that's its dating, although it was found in the, around 1840s. So uh, that's how we know it was uh, altered later in time. Now, that has to have an implication on 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scripture is inspired of God, right? Let's look at that. So this is the uh, King James version of that. If you look in the center in the white area, all scripture is italicized. Please note that is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, if this verse is taken as correct, then what do we learn? That all the people who are looking at the King James Bible in uh, 1611 were looking at the correct verse, and all the people who are looking at the NIV and, and 23 other versions have it all wrong. And so even though it's Scripture, it's in a book called Scripture, it's in a book even titled Holy Scripture, but it's false, right? Because 24 times... 24 major translations all have it wrong, and only seven have it right. 22% get it right, 78% get it wrong. So this verse cannot possibly be true as written. And so what, what did we, uh, so let's look at the black area. This verse alone is the frequent proof of inspiration without proof of prophetic validation. So this verse has been misused in its current form because something's wrong with this verse, and we have other episodes on this, but this is going to highlight the mistake in the King James Version actually translating this verse. So this verse is false, and the actual vindication of the King James Version on Revelation 22, 14 helps prove this verse is a false uh, uh, change. And what's the change? The word is in italics. That, and and we, we, in our prior video on this verse in particular, 2 Timothy 3, 16, we pointed out is, is not binding. In other words, it was, we need to show this to you, oops, we got to go backwards. Wait, we're going to go forwards. Okay, so in the original verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, in the Tyndale version, and he wrote in 1522 to 1536 his Tyndale Bible, he has it correct. And it says, for all scripture given by inspiration. Do you see that? All scripture given by inspiration, right there, of God is profitable to teach, to improve, to amend, and to instruct in righteousness, yet... yet ye, ye man of God may be perfect and prepared unto all good works. This is old English. It's a little tricky sometimes to read. But anyway, the point is, there is no is there. And this is correct. All scripture given by inspiration of God. And why does why does, why is it correct without the is? Because the word scripture only means writing. So if I said all writing given by inspiration of God, I'm saying it's a writing, like my laundry ticket is a writing, given by inspiration, okay, then that excludes my laundry ticket, right? So it was a modifier. Therefore, the word scripture never was intended, even in that time period, to signify that it's inspired. The problem is, though, as a result of the mistake that's going to come later, with the King James adding the word is, all scripture is given by inspiration. Well, then everything written, technically, that means everything. My laundry ticket. I mean, it, it's in a comprehensive term. You And you just try to redefine the word scripture 
and you hope the reader is only going to connect it to the words of our scripture or our writings, but the uh, the writings of Mahatma Gandhi are scripture because they are writings. The word scripture has no connotation whatsoever of holy writings. But so the answer is this is uh, this is a true passage, Second Timothy three sixteen in the Tyndale, but. It is not true. That is is a problem. That that is a false. What would have been the correct term? So we need to learn this. So when you're studying and trying to figure out, okay, did someone mean holy scripture? Well, there is a way that is said, and you'll see there to the right it says eros graphe or eros grammata. That's how you say holy scripture or whole, excuse me, holy writing. So graphe by itself, which is the word here in 2 Timothy 3.16, does not mean anything more than my laundry ticket. <laughs> it means it could, could be anything. It could be a note I wrote this morning. So not everything written is inspired. So you cannot say all scriptures can by inspiration of God because that's false if, if you know what the word scripture means. But you can see what happens over two or three centuries of people hearing all scripture is inspired of God. You start to think the word scripture has some heightened meaning but since you can call scripture anything that's written, it, it, it is absurd. And so it's just taking advantage of what? The gullibility of people who don't know any better that, to how to decipher what this is trying to say. And this is a just this is their go-to verse to say, hey, you can't dispute Paul because he's a writing. He's a writing we call we have called scripture. And and you don't know how to respond because you don't know this is a false verse. And you don't know that that is doesn't belong there. And let's prove again so you know what, why the word, is. here's the here's the rule. Biblebelievers.com points out the italicization in the King James is what? Well, just, just a suggestion. It's not binding. It's not inspired itself. The italicized words in the King James Bible are words that were added by the translators to help the reader. They thought it might help you. Uh, this is usually necessary when translating from one language to another because the word meanings and idioms change. So to produce a more readable translation, the King James translators added certain words to the Bible text. However, to make sure that everyone understood that those words were not in the available manuscripts, they set them in italics. So it's not really there. They think they're claiming it's only meant to be make it readable. It's Now get this. It's not supposed to change the meaning of the verse. But you see... But you see, it does change the meaning. The word, the verse saying all scripture is given by inspiration is very different from what, what Tyndale said, all scripture given by inspiration. So in this situation, with Tyndale's meaning, you have to prove it. You have to prove it's inspired. You can't assume my laundry ticket is inspired because it's a scripture, because it's a writing. So this is, this is uh, and, and so what have we now shown? What is this whole thing about? Uh, Revelation 22, verse 14, proven. It's proven that just because the NIV is scripture does not mean it's locked in stone and someone can come back and say, hey, are you challenging the word of God? The word of God, it's all, it's all inspired. It, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You can't do that. The NIV is scripture. But you can say, wait a minute, that's impossible. The King James Version had it the other way. It had it... Uh, that it's all, you know, if you obey the commandments, then you can eat from the tree of life. And the NIV changed that. Oh, so all scripture is not inspired of God. That's right. So so what do I do with 2 Timothy 3.16? You should tell them you need to go revisit that. I re learned something I never knew before. When the King James uses italics, it means it's not really there. And the person say, I've never even heard of that. I didn't even, I've never noticed any italics in the K, in the KGV. So here's where you can educate them on something. So I'm going to show you something else that you need to see. Watch this. Okay, so when you go to the BibleHub.com, or you even go to Bible, Bible Hub or Bible Gateway, this is Bible Gateway. This is what a screen looks like when you go to 2 Timothy 3.16. And you're going to see all scripture is given by inspiration. There's no italics there. Now, if you wanted to see the italics consistently and not have to do what I'm going to show you, you go to www.kingjamesbible.com. They always show you the italics. They, they are honest, honest people. And I'm going to be bold here. Is This is a dishonest presentation to you of the King James Bible because you should be trained to know italics in the King James Bible means it's not really there, it's readability, and it should never change the meaning of the text. That wasn't its purpose. Its purpose was not to create new meaning, okay, like it did in John 2 Timothy 3.16. It definitely creates a very significant change 
and it was not supposed to do it. Just it was supposed to aid readability. Anything else is, is illicit that's trying to rewrite the word of God. And that's, and that's verbatim. So this is burdensome. I got to remember this website, King James Bible. So shouldn't we have any help? Well, there is a secret weapon here. Well, I shouldn't say it's a weapon. I'm going to show you something. Now, do you see this is a video I put in here into this slide in PowerPoint? And this video is going to play for you. I'm going to change it from the King James Version. You see up here where it says King James Version? That's over here on the left. But this is, uh, this is the video on the right. And I'm going to show you what happens when I hit the video button. So you see it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the King James Version. Did you know there's another heading within the Bible Gateway? You can find the real King James Version. The real one, not this phony one, not this fake and not this fraud pretending to be the King James Version. That's what I'm telling you. This is a fraudulent version of it because it's not true. This is not the King James Bible. This we're going to see is the King James Bible. So now we're switching. All scripture. So now it's switching to the authorized King James. We're going to stop it hopefully on time this time. Oh, it went away, it went away. Uh, there, okay. Anyway, you get to see it. There it is. See, oh, is, is italicized. So when you want to see the true King James, not the fraud, you have to go to the authorized King James. So I suggest just to show you, I, you know, I'm in such bad habit. I always go to the King James because that's what I thought. And I didn't realize this is where you get the italics. I didn't realize it for, for a long period of time. So now I know. So this is really where I need to go to make sure I see the true King James, not the fraudulent King James. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine the, the most material thing about the King James Bible that the reader needs to know is when you see italics, those are not really words that are there. They're meant for readability and they should never change the meaning of the text. That's the basic bottom line of what the, the, what the King James editor says its purpose was not to change meanings of text, but just to make it more readable, easier to understand, but never to change a meaning. And yet that's what they did inadvertently, supposedly. But you can see there's a very tempting thing that went on there because now what's the main proof text that you you can't question, Paul? You can't question anything. You shouldn't be able to even question Revelation. Revel Revelation 22, 14, they should never have questioned Reve Re Revelation 22, verse 14 in the King James because of this verse, the way they had mistranslated it, right? It, it, and, and then took the, is, the italics away so they, they, nobody could see it. They should never have touched the Revelation 22, 14 just for that reason alone, to be consistent with themselves. But of course, they're, they're very self-serving, so they'll change. They know that they know that 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible translators and NIV people, they know that verse doesn't actually have the italics. The word is there. So they know they can violate that, but they don't tell you you're entitled to do that. They don't tell you you're allowed to be have a freedom to decide whether that verse is right or wrong based on the italics. They're not even letting you see the option of it. They create a fraudulent image of the King James Bible just for us suckers. And we just don't ever connect the word authorized King James Bible with something we need to read. Well, who wants to read something that's authorized by a king? Sounds terrible. Sounds like it's controlled by the government. King James Bible sounds a lot better. It's free. It's something we just called, we gave an honorific name to the king. It doesn't sound like I'm getting permission from the king to read this, which by the way, the King James Bible was called authorized because what happened? There were about 10, 15 other English Bibles. Do you know what the implication of King James's order was? That all these other Bibles were now illegal. So the King James Bible was not intended to create religious freedom or more knowledge. It was designed to suppress all the other Bibles and all those translations that were in conflict with the Calvinist view. The two editors of the King James Bible, the first and the second, were both Calvinists and strictly putting that, saturating the scripture with all the readings that the Calvinists, the Geneva Study Bible, that they preferred, and that's why that's why King James he he came from the Presbyterian Church of Scotland when he was king there, and when he became king of England, he just brought the Presbyterian uh, 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 Church from Scotland into the British life. And the best way to do it was to create a Bible that would be what would be run by the Puritans. They would do all the editing, and that's why we have this Bible, the King James Bible. I know, I know, people love it, and it's it, and I think it's very good. It's very good.
but it also has got a lot of false things about it. And these is's were problematic. You should never have even put in an italic for this particular one. Very misleading, changes the meaning substantially. And everybody knows that. And that's why they and that's why they want it to be there. And they and, and that's why they got rid of the italics. And in fact, I would tell you, I even think the reason they got rid of the italics and created this whole distinction between the King James and authorized King James for this one verse, because this is the verse they want more than anything. Second Timothy 316 to survive any any uh, uh, scrutiny on the italicization issue because all the other ones really are for readability. But this one is the only one you'll find that actually changed the meaning. So they were 100% doing it right until they get to this one and they cheated. <laughs> so the King James people cheated. Sorry, Corey. I know you love the King James, but they cheated here. And they, they, and they didn't really get away with it because they permanently put it into the 1611 Bible. So they needed their buddies down the road to remove the italics and create this whole separation where you can literally only see it if you know enough to look for the authorized King James. So I hope, I hope we can see we're learning a lot just from this sec this Revelation 22 verse 14 and going through all the implications of it and studying all the effects of reversing that verse it means we are literally saying a word a passage of scripture is false and we're saying 24 out of 31 are false demonstrably false meaning it's not that you cannot make this decision based on how many people are willing to connive and conspire for a fraudulent version that matches up with Paul. That's not the way of making a decision. You make the decision based on what is the correct manuscripts and what is the most likely authoritative. And we have that conclusively, right? So let's go over that again, because I want to show you, I pulled up the, uh, remember there was this uh, uh, Anna Briz she provided us uh, the one from the 300s, 400s, and the uh, 500s. Right. Okay. So the Ambrose she cited was uh, he was a bishop of Rome from 374 to 397. So he quotes the wash the robes. So that would pin the likely date of the wash the robes to in that range. So it could be as almost virtually 400 AD. And then uh, the next is 460 AD, and the next is somebody who uh, dies in the 500s, Apringius. So this is uh, this is how I would say you you can prove that the origin of this was way way after the uh, the original ones, which started with Tertullian, Cyprian. Now we know the Sinaitic is 350, and then we know late 300s would be the and Vaticanus 350. And then late 300s, and then the 400s and the 500s. So the when you look at the weights of the dates, the dates, that's how you know which one is correct and which is false. Okay, so I, I think I finished this. Um, I'm going to do a brief, quick anecdote to just say something is this to encourage people in your studies on your own as a layperson, not having gone to Bible college. This doesn't require Bible college knowledge to just go dig this stuff up and find the church writers the commentators when they use things and and there's and there's nothing nobody uh, can uh, claim there's somebody trying to bias the text towards jesus that needs to be avoided i mean you know if someone if someone biased the text and make jesus more jesus <laughs> that would not be bad but we can see there's a bias towards paul which happens in what when constantine comes to power he wants to get rid of Sabbath, and the only person who supports him in the New Testament that he can get rid of Sabbath is Paul in three passages, Colossians, and I've shown you, Colossians, Galatians, and Romans. When you put them collectively together, Luther and Calvin were in, in a total accord that Paul, quote, abolished Sabbath, and we have the video series on that. So that's what they want to do for purposes of Constantine, because he wants people to worship now on Sunday, the God of Saul Invictus. His day is Sunday. 321 AD, Constantine set a law. He's a he's a Pontifex Maximus of all religions. He wants everyone to rest. So that's where this all comes from. That's why they wanted Paul to win. And he gets emphasized. His doctrine starts saturating the Roman Catholic Church. They start having this uh, whole thing where they they're going down the wrong path when they're when they're uh, trying to serve Constantine's pagan ideology. And uh, so I wanted to tell you a little story quickly my grandmother i gave her an italian bible 
And uh, I thought she would appreciate it. She speaks Italian. She reads Italian. She speaks very, very little English. Uh, sweet lady, a godly woman, goes to church every Sunday to Catholic Church, uh, listens. And, and I thought she wouldn't appreciate getting a Bible in Italian. Guess what? She told me, not immediately, but later that day, I think it was Christmas holiday in the, in the, the 70s sometime. And she said to me, uh, no, 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 no. I, I, she, you know, I, she says, I said, haven't you read it? It had been a couple of days. We've been visiting at her house for a few days. And she's, and I asked her, hey, did, yeah, did you enjoy, enjoy reading the Italian Bible? And she says, no, 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 we're not allowed to read that. I said, what do you mean we're not allowed to read that, Grandma? What do you mean? She says, oh, no, 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 no. Only the priest can read it. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, only the, the Bible is not open to private interpretation. It's only for the priest to read it. I said, Grandma, that's that's not that verse doesn't mean you can't study the Bible. We're supposed to study the Bible to show ourselves approved. So I tell her, you know, we're supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to study it. And she goes, uh, oh, no, no, no. And then she told me a story. And this was the story. She said when she was a little girl, now she she leaves Italy, I think she's about like 12 years old, 13 years old, and becomes a seamstress in downtown New York City in the, the sweat mills of those era. But before that, she was a little girl in a Catholic church, Catholic school, and and when she went to church, she said nobody could read the Bible. It was kept up front, chained by a, a chain to a wooden podium that was, you know, put down into the ground. So you couldn't pull out the, the wooden podium and take the Bible. And you could nobody could steal the Bible. Nobody could take it. It was chained. And we could only go up there and read it when the priest was there. And we had to ask him to help us understand it, blah, blah, blah. So nobody ever read it, apparently. <laughs> so that's how she lived her life, afraid of reading it afraid of having a private interpretation, having a different meaning from what her priest is telling her what she has to believe. This is unbelievable when you when you think about it. And I just pray to God mercy on all these kind of people who were totally misled by a church doing what? Using bias, control, manipulation of the mind, censorship. The ultimate censorship is to make someone frightened to read the Bible. Do you see? And that's why this is so important to me is because that uh, that Bible was locked up so people couldn't see it. Now we have an opportunity to unlock the Bible, all of us. We're all going to participate in this effort to bring the Bible out in the open and, and put a light on those things that have been falsely uh, uh, used to deprecate the Bible, take it in a different direction, take it in the direction of Paul, destroy the message of Jesus, take him down a notch, make him irrelevant, make Paul the only thing that anybody listens to. And a verse like this, which seemingly seems, you know, to me, it's just, what's the problem with obey the commandments and you have eternal life. You go to eat the tree of life. What's the problem with that? Jesus says that in Matthew 19, and he says it in Luke 16, the same passage, same thing twice. What What's the problem? They can't assist. They can't handle that. They got to change it. So maybe it was even deliberately changed back in the uh, late four uh, with Ambrose. We'd have to study Ambrose. Was he a, uh, did he have some tendencies towards Paul in doctrine? So maybe that would maybe we should look at that because he's the first one who seems to quote it as an early quote father. And and so we, you know we could we could go a deeper dive. But I, to me, the only thing is we've proven beyond a doubt it's obey the commandments. All right. So let's unchain the Bible. Let's make that Bible available to people and let's get rid of these false fake verses and encourage and, and demand as, as a Christian community that the Bibles be changed to take out the words, uh, uh, wash the robes and put what was there in the King James, which was correct, which is obey the commandments. And those who are not doing that are guilty of the sin in Revelation 22, 18, which will send you to have your name blotted out of the book of life. So it's not inconsequential. It's very important. So if you know uh, an editor or someone connected to one of, any of these 24 Bibles, and I listed them in a prior video, then then please, please uh, help them and, and let them know to uh, repent and go fix their Bibles. Okay, God bless. Take care, everybody. Ciao. Bye.